Hey everyone, Dr. Armagani here today to talk to you guys about the cervical disc arthroplasty procedure, also known as a disc replacement. If you have symptoms of pain or numbness and tingling starting around your neck area and going into your shoulder or arm, also known as cervical radiculopathy, this procedure can help make those symptoms better. Today though, we'll discuss the normal anatomy of the neck, as well as how I perform this procedure step by step. At the end, I'll discuss risks, expected recovery, and post-operative restrictions. If you'd like to move around a little bit, you can click in the description below for timestamps to move around to different portions of this video. And that's going to be the overview for the video today. Let's get started. Okay, now that we're in, let's talk about the topic for today cervical disc arthroplasty. Before we get into how to do this procedure, we need to have an understanding of what the normal anatomy looks like. Over here on your left, this is going to be a normal cervical vertebrae, but this is going to be a front view, as if you're looking at it right from your throat. Now, what you'll see here is that up top, this is going to be where your head is, and then your feet are at the bottom. Let's take a look at some of these important anatomic landmarks. The first of these is going to be the vertebral body. You can think of the vertebral body as the building blocks that make up your spinal column. They're stacked up right on top of each other. In between these vertebrae are going to be the discs, which are outlined here in blue. The discs are a rubbery material, which act like a cushion in between the vertebrae. This also allows you to have motion and flexibility in your neck. Next, we have the vertebral artery. These are arteries that come off of the main blood vessels in your chest and go through the neck all the way up into your brain. These are important structures for us to know and see if there are any abnormalities in the vertebral arteries prior to a procedure. Lastly, we have our nerve root here outlined in green. What you'll find is that at each disc space in between two vertebrae, you have a nerve root exiting off to the left or to the right. These nerve roots go to specific areas of your arm and can give sensation and muscle strength. Now let's move on to the top view or the cross-section view. So before we were looking at a view from straight on, this time we're looking at you as if we're in cross section. So if we cut you right in half through a disc space. The first thing you'll want to notice here is the orientation. The back of your neck is going to be up top here and the front of your neck is in the front. Again, this is a cross sectional view of you through a disc space. Speaking of the disc, the disc is going to be outlined here in blue. The disc is again the cushiony material in between two vertebrae. Next we have the vertebral arteries. We want to know where these are at all times to help prevent any sort of blood vessel injury during surgery. It is very rare that this happens, but we want to be aware of where they are at all times. Next we have the nerve roots, which I said again come off in between vertebrae at each area of the cervical spine and go down to specific areas of your arm or upper back. The spinal cord is highlighted here in purple. As you can see, the area where the spinal cord lives is what we call the spinal canal. The spinal canal is bordered by the disc space in the front and then the spinous process and lamina, which is immediately behind it as shown here. Now, when you touch the back of your neck, that very tip of the bone that you feel, that's going to be the very tip of that spinous process. Now let's quickly go through the side view. Orientation again. This is going to be where your brain is and top of your head. This will be down towards where your feet are. The front of your neck is over here on the left and the back of your skin of the neck is going to be here on the right. The structures that we want to see here are going to be the vertebrae outlined in purple with a disc in between each vertebrae. The vertebral artery is highlighted here in black and at each area in between the vertebrae, there is a nerve root that goes to a specific area of your arm or upper back. Lastly, the spinous process is highlighted in yellow. And again, this is the area or part of the bone that you can feel when you're touching the back of your neck. You're actually touching these tip of the bones here. Now imagine this front view again, but instead we make a cut right down the middle. What will we see? So here is what that side view ends up looking like if we cut you right down the middle. What you'll find is over here towards the left side of the screen is going to be where the front of your neck is. Your throat and esophagus will be in this area. And then the back of your neck will be here. Let's look at some of these structures more closely though in this particular view. The vertebral bodies are highlighted in purple 
And as you remember, there is a disc in between each vertebrae. And that's what we're seeing here highlighted in blue. The spinal cord is in green. And lastly, the spinous processes are highlighted here in yellow. This is what the normal cervical vertebrae will look like without any degeneration at all. What you'll find here is you'll have vertebrae right on top of each other with a disc in between. No compression of the spinal cord at all in this particular normal cervical vertebrae that we're looking at. But not everybody has a normal cervical vertebrae. Sometimes people have a degenerative cervical vertebrae. What we see in patients who have a degenerative cervical vertebrae is we see that they have a couple changes down to their body. The first thing that we're able to see different between this degenerative spine and the normal spine is the size of the disc. You can see here that the disc is not as tall as it was in the normal cervical vertebrae. This happens with normal degeneration. However, as the disc degenerates and gets smaller, you start to form bone spurs, which we have highlighted here in purple. Now you can have bone spurs out near the front and this won't cause any problems because there are no important structures here that can get compressed. However, in the back of the vertebrae, there are important structures here that can get compressed, mainly the spinal cord highlighted here in yellow. The last thing that happens though is you also see some disc bulging which we have highlighted here in blue. All of this together creates kinking of the spinal cord, which can cause spinal cord dysfunction or nerve compression, which can then cause pain, discomfort, and sensation changes down the arm. Now, what is the goal of doing a procedure like this? Our goal is to try to remake normal anatomy. We need to remove all those degenerative features that we saw previously. We need to remove the bone spurs, we need to remove any disc bulging, and we need to make the disc height what it used to be back when it was normal. This is what our degenerative spine looks like before surgery. But then after surgery, look what happens. We put this very nice device in, which helps mimic normal motion within your disc. This is the disc replacement device. What you'll also see now is that there's no more compression on the spinal cord anymore. All the bone spurs from the back of these vertebrae were removed, as well as the disc. Lastly, the height has been restored between the vertebrae, giving it a more normal, natural look compared to what it looked like previously. So how do we perform this procedure? The first step that we do is we take our burr and we identify these bone spurs that are right here on the front of the vertebrae that are going to be highlighted here in blue. We take this high-speed burr and we're able to shave away that anterior part or front part of the bone spurs to make the area where your vertebrae are flat. Let's see how that's done here. So we'll take our burr and we'll remove those anterior bone spurs so it's nice and flat right on the front surface of the vertebrae. That's going to be step one. Following that, we want to place distractor pins into the vertebrae. What these distractor pins do is they try to create space between the vertebrae to try to remake the size of your disc space, which it was previously. After we place the distractor pins within the vertebrae, we want to distract them apart, creating more space in the disc space area for us to try to remove that degenerative disc. You can see here that the space is much taller than it was previously just by placing these distractor pins in place. Next, we take an instrument called a curette and we're able to put this within the disc space and help remove some of that disc material initially. This is what it looks like after we removed part of that disc. But now we still have some bone spurs here on the front lip and those need to be removed with our high speed burr. So what we'll do is we'll take our high-speed burr and we'll remove those areas that we highlighted previously in blue, as well as some more of the disc in the back. Once that's complete, we still have a little bit of disc left as well as any compression that could be on the spinal cord. So we take our curette and we take it all the way back to the back of the vertebrae so that we can fully remove that disc material. Once that disc material is removed, there are no more bone spurs in the back and no more disc material left within the disc space to impinge upon the spinal cord or nerves. Once we remove all the compression of the spinal cord and nerves, the spinal cord returns to its normal position. Now that there's no more compression upon the spinal cord and the bone spurs as well as the disc have been completely removed and the disc space has been distracted to a normal height, we then insert the disc arthroplasty device which has been designed to fit your anatomy perfectly. So we'll go ahead and place that device in between the bones 
and then we will go ahead and remove the distractor pins. With the disc arthroplasty device in place, there is again no more compression of the spinal cord and all the bone spurs have been removed. To remind you again, before surgery you can see how small the disc was before and the resulting bone spurs and compression of the spinal cord and nerves. However, after surgery, all of those bone spurs and disc have been removed as well as the disc being returned to its normal height. One of the biggest advantages of the disc arthroplasty device is maintenance of your range of motion. The great thing about having your range of motion kept is that it helps preserve the health of the remaining discs within your neck. If you do a fusion in one area of your neck, the rest of the neck motion gets extended over to those discs above and below where your fusion is. However, if you have a motion preserving procedure like this cervical disc arthroplasty, you don't have to worry about those additional discs seeing increased stress. Let's see what that would look like. Well, when you extend your neck backwards, the disc device is able to roll backwards and open up in the front. You can see that the amount of space opened up in the front here. Now, when you flex your neck down, though, you're able to get a lot of gapping back here, and that space ends up closing down. This is the normal motion that you're going to see with your neck as you go back between flexion and extension. This is the goal of that procedure is to preserve this, which again, helps decrease stress on the discs above and below where you had your procedure done. And that's how I perform a cervical disc arthroplasty step by step. What are the risks of this procedure? After surgery, patients do complain of swallowing difficulty for a few weeks. The reason for this is because we have to move your esophagus out of the way for about 30 to 45 minutes per disc that we are doing this procedure on. A small percentage of patients do have long-term problems with swallowing. Only about 4% of the time does this happen. Neck pain can occur from time to time following this procedure because if you think about it, we took a very collapsed disc and we may have made you a little bit taller as a result of placing in the disc arthroplasty device. Those ligaments and muscles are used to being shortened, but in the span of only about 30 to 45 minutes, that area is able to be stretched out. Once it's stretched, you can feel a whiplash type effect or a neck soreness, which takes about three to four weeks to loosen up, but it does get better as time goes on. Reoperation is another concern that we have from time to time, particularly in patients who have soft bone. When you place in this metal device in between the vertebrae, if you have soft bone, there is a chance that the bones can collapse around the arthroplasty device. That can cause recurrent pain. If that happens, we sometimes have to convert to a fusion. This is rare if it happens though. Lastly, persistent arm pain is something that can occur as well. If you think about what we do as a spine surgeon, our job is to take the pressure off of nerves that then allows your body time to go through the healing process and fix any damage that's been done to that nerve. Unfortunately, we're not able to fix a permanently damaged nerve. It takes about one year for a nerve to fully heal following a procedure like this. This doesn't mean that you can't be doing the things that you wanna do, but how you feel at one year is going to be how you're going to feel long term. What's the recovery like following surgery? I generally do this procedure as an outpatient, meaning you come in and go home the same day. For some patients, I do keep them overnight if I want them to be observed closely. This is decided upon before surgery. Neck pain and swallowing difficulty is going to be something that you experience with this procedure, but it generally gets better after about three to four weeks. And lastly, nerves take about one year to get better. So no snap judgments on surgery. This is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. In the short term, you can have some good days with your arm or some bad days with your arm. The reason why is this. Think about it this way. You've had your nerve compressed for quite a long time. As a result of your nerve being compressed for a very long time, the rest of the muscles in your arm have become hypersensitive because they need to hear as much of the signal as they can from the brain. That signal has been diminished though because of the previous compression. Then within about 30 to 45 minutes, we remove all of that compression and now all the muscles and nerves within the arm are getting normal signals from the brain. That can cause some increased pain in the arm for a short period of time until the nerves are able to re-equilibrate themselves. That takes about a month or so. Full recovery of nerves though takes about one year. During that time period though, you're gonna have some good days, some bad days, some good weeks, some bad weeks. 
How you feel at one year, though, is going to be how you feel long-term. What can I do post-op? For patients that are going home as an outpatient, I usually have a bandage on that has a drain inside the bandage. Once you remove that bandage on the first day after surgery, the drain will come out with it. Once that happens, pat the area where your incision is dry, and then you can place a new bandage over the top of the incision. If you're going home from the hospital, I will do that part for you before you leave. Once this bandage is removed though and changed for the first time, you're allowed to shower on the second day after surgery. What I mean by shower is you can remove the bandage that was covering your incision and let soap and water run down your head and neck just as you would as you were normally showering. You will have butterfly strips that are helping to hold the incision intact because all the stitches are on the inside. After about one week, those butterfly strips will fall off on their own. If they're not off by a week, you can pull them off yourself. After about a week or so, you don't have to keep wearing a bandage over the incision once you leave the shower. You could leave it open to air after one week. From a restriction perspective, I generally don't want you bending, twisting, or lifting greater than 20 pounds for about six weeks. The reason for this is just to allow time for the muscles in the back of your neck to start healing and for your nerves to start re-equilibrating to getting normal signals from the brain. It is okay though for you to walk as much as you want. More impact type activities such as jogging or running can be done later on, but you should probably work your way up to that. From a pain management perspective, I'd like you to take Tylenol 1000 milligrams three times a day with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The reason why I say take Tylenol is because it does give a good background level of pain relief. In addition, because this is not a fusion type procedure, it is okay to take an anti-inflammatory. If you have one that you use at home, you can take that one. Or if you don't, you could take 600 milligrams of over-the-counter ibuprofen three times a day as well. Just space it out to take it two hours after you take the Tylenol dose. So for example, if you wanna do both of them together, you would take Tylenol at 8 a.m., ibuprofen at 10 a.m., Tylenol again at noon, ibuprofen at two o'clock, Tylenol at four o'clock, and then ibuprofen at six o'clock. So that you're just taking stuff throughout the day that is non-narcotic. If you need to take higher dose pain medication or the prescription pain medication or muscle relaxer, taking these over-the-counter medications will decrease your need for that. Most of my patients are only taking prescription pain medication for a couple weeks following this procedure. Thanks again. And there you have it, the cervical disc arthroplasty procedure, also known as a total disc replacement. Hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of the anatomy, step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure, as well as what to expect postoperatively. If you're curious about the conditions that can be treated with this procedure and are on YouTube, please click the links below to find the educational videos about cervical radiculopathy and cervical myelopathy. To have a consultation with me regarding your spine, you can find our office phone number below, or you can click book an appointment above if you're on our website, www.armaganispine.com. You can also find me on these other platforms. And if you're viewing this video on YouTube, please comment, hit like, and subscribe to be notified about future educational videos such as these. Take care.